Well, I have 530. Uh, let's get started to maximize everybody's time. Good evening and welcome to the University of Illinois Civil and Environmental Engineering Department's Fall Faculty Research Webinar. My name is Doug Pelletier and I will be tonight's moderator. Tonight's presentation will be Three Tiny Tales from the World of Construction Materials by Professor Nishant Garg. I have a short bio for the professor. Uh, professor Garg is an assistant professor in the CE department working on the chemistry and characterization of construction materials. Previously, he was a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University where he applied X-ray and neutron scattering to characterize novel and sustainable cements. He obtained his PhD in nanoscience at Aarhus University, Denmark in 2015, where he used solid state NMR to study cements and clay minerals. With his multidisciplinary background in chemistry, material science, and civil engineering, he has spent his research career in developing a fundamental understanding of sustainable, durable, and environment-friendly cement-based materials. After the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session as time permits. Uh, please post your questions on the chat. Um, PDH certificates will be sent out to those that are registered and are in attendance. And with that, I will hand it, hand it over to Professor Garg. Okay, thank you so much. Um, are you able to hear me all right? Okay, all right. Well, um, good evening, everyone. So I'm Nishant Kark, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the world of construction materials. And I've got three uh, tiny stories here I'm, I would like to share with you. Um, I guess one thing I would want to request you is that if you have questions, feel free to ask them as we go. Uh, you don't need to wait until the end. Uh, this way, it's not a long uh, monologue from my side. And of course, I will also pause in the middle uh, to discuss, so let's keep it uh, interactive and feel free to have any questions, uh, ask any questions in the chat. Okay, so let's get started here. Um, so the way I've structured this talk, we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce, um, let's give a little bit of historical perspective on construction materials and then talk about the three um, aspects, uh, sustainability, circularity, and resilience, and then end with an outlook. And while I was kind of, you know, looking through my notes here, I was trying to see historically, uh, if you look at what kind of different uh, things different civilizations have done, and also looking at different construction materials um, that have been used, we can go all the way, you know, back to the ancient Egypt, look at the pyramids, uh, look at the ancient, um, Asian, uh, Chinese and Indian, uh, infrastructure, we can look at uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and so on. So it's it's really can get quite a lot. So it's hard to you know cover all that if you want to make take a historical take. But I thought what I would do here instead in this talk is um, if we consider time as this axis uh, from my own travels in the past few years, I took some specific snapshots in time, and I thought I would share that with you just to get a grounding of what has been there uh, in the past. So we'll start with the seventh century, uh, some construction uh, that uh, I saw in India earlier this year. I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. Then we'll move uh, 700 years forward. We'll go to the 14th century, where we'll look at some of the ancient construction in Thailand. I was here actually last week. And uh, then obviously we'll move to the present, which is uh, the 21st century. And we'll talk about the three uh, things here, so sustainability, uh, circularity, and resilience, and we'll define what those terms means in the context of construction materials, and we'll go from there. Okay, so that is that will be the plan for the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and as I said, feel free to ask uh, your questions in the chat as we go. So let's start with this, um, uh, the first uh, item I have here, so this is actually me on the bottom right, standing right next to an uh, ancient uh, set of structures or, or you know, uh, monuments or temples. This is in Mahabalipuram in uh, southern part of India, south of Chennai. I, I visited um, IIT Madras uh, in, in January uh, this year and had a chance to uh, visit some of these places. And it's really fascinating to look at them from, again, construction materials point of view. It's a seventh century construction by the Pallava uh, dynasty. And if you look at this entire uh, structure here on the left side, it's made out of entirely of a single piece of granite. So they take this big, uh, large chunk of rock and they carve it 
through that to get this uh, amazing shape, which is in the shape of chariots. So it's uh, fully uh, rock cut and it is uh, freestanding. If you look at it, if you look at closely at one of the pillars, if you look at all these pillars, they have these kind of uh, uh, kind of interesting creatures carved on them. Uh, and these are some pictures I just basically took from my iPhone. If you look at this one of these pillars, if you zoom in a little bit, it's kind of a mixture of like a lion and, uh, and I think uh, some kind of another animal. If you look very closely at the nose of this animal, you can basically see uh, it's basically granite. And they call, also call this the pink granite, which is basically, as we know, a mixture of quartz and feldspar. And you can see these individual crystals very clearly just from an iPhone. And it would be nice if I could able to get a sample to the lab to analyze it further. But this is basically 1400 year old uh, granite that we are looking at. And it is of course uh, still standing um, uh, as, as it is. If you look at maybe now move 700 years forward, if you look at another uh, structure, uh, this here is a, a Buddhist uh, monastery. Uh, it's in uh, Thailand. So it's a very interesting story behind this. Also, I visited here last week. So this is from the city called Ayutthaya, which actually is, I, I learned that this is comes from the Sanskrit word Ayodhya, which means invincible. So the Siamese king named it after uh, the Sanskrit word to keep it, which means invincible. It lasted for about 400 years. And um, on the right here is the plan of the monastery. And uh, again, it was built in the 14th uh, century uh, by the Siamese. And it's a classic brick and mortar style construction. So you're using bricks and then um, mortar to hold them together. So in this one, I climbed all the way to the top here. So if you see the stairs and the, my, my mouse pointer to the left, and when you go um, towards the top here, so this one of these uh, structures here, we look at it more closely in the next slide. And uh, this is what we have here. And if you look at it, again, it's a, it's a brick and mortar side construction, but of course, you know, what has happened is over time, of course, it has undergone some degradation and you can see some uh, of that patchwork being applied here, and this is probably something happening with the mortar or the bricks. If you zoom into it a little bit, you can um, again see this interface where this uh, additional patch has been applied, which I'm guessing is uh, more recent. But I think what is more interesting is if you look at the joints between the bricks where the mortar is applied, and if you look at it very closely, and at several parts, it's basically missing. And if you go one step further, and again, I think this is the limit of what an iPhone can do uh, in a tourist setting, uh, you can actually now start to see these individual um, crystals uh, which are left over from the mortar, right? So these are probably quartz uh, from the sand that has been used. It's hard to say exactly what kind of mortar they used because at this time, of course, they did not have uh, access to the cements we have. So I'm guessing it's some kind of uh, uh, lime-based mortar or a gypsum-based mortar that has been used. And over time, due to weathering events and rain events, uh, it has uh, it has been uh, washed away or degraded, and that's what um, causes structural issues. The brick, as it is, is much more you can say, uh, I guess, resilient. Uh, but of course, the mortar, the sticking glue, is what is um, vulnerable uh, to weathering action. Let's move uh, maybe seven hundred years uh, forward. So we go from seventh to the fourteenth century, and then we go to the twenty-first century. Uh, for the 21st century, you know, there's plenty of examples to pick from. So I just pick something uh, closer to home here. So as you know, this is the Chicago skyline. And in principle, you can put any uh, city's uh, skyline here. And we are really able to build these now massive, massive uh, and tall uh, superstructures that were not possible hundreds of years ago. And what is the reason? Right? Why can we do this now and why these were not possible before? Well, um, the reasoning is the answer basically lies if we go back about... Um, 200 years ago to 1824, when Portland cement was uh, discovered or invented. And the original patent, um, uh, of course, you can still find it online. I think it's really fascinating. So Joseph Asprin, at that time, he called uh, the cement he invented artificial stone. And this was a very kind of a clever marketing around it, because at that time, people were not, uh, people were really interested and felt the stone masonry was a very durable so sort of construction. So he called his cement uh, the patent as artificial stone. And the whole um, reason, if you look at this, this pattern in which he discloses the entire uh, recipe of making it, he says, and I, which I call Portland cement, um, is um, 
essentially actually the name of the the town uh, in southern England where the stone was very famous. It was considered to be very durable. So he used this kind of a marketing trick to call his cement Portland cement. And then somehow throughout those 200 years, uh, this Portland cement, uh, the name has stuck. That's what we use uh, until today. And there are pictures from, you know, this early uh, kilns that he has, uh, they were using the beehive kilns to make this. And of course the modern kiln, the rotary kiln is much different. I'm gonna see that shortly. Uh, but this is where it all started. We now had basically a glue which can hold together different things, uh, which maze makes the current infrastructure possible. So how do we make uh, cement? Well, essentially today we take uh, limestone and clay in, in a certain proportion. We add them together to this uh, rotary kiln, which is really a modern engineering marble. And you take it to really high temperatures, you know, 1450 degrees Celsius uh, temperatures, which again, uh, many civilizations do not have access to, we have. And when we do that, we generate, uh, we create new set of phases uh, we call a cement. And by the way, just to give you a scale of this kiln, these kilns are massive, uh, again, depending on where you are. But for example, if I show you a photo of, of one of the kilns, so here the kiln is on the, uh, top left. This is a kiln from a cement plant in Missouri. It produces about 1 million tons of cement per year. So that's about a few thousand tons every day. And uh, me and a couple of my students are standing here uh, right next to it. And just to give you an idea of the scale, and uh, I take students here every year uh, as a part of this course I teach on cement chemistry. So I can tell you at this moment, every one of us is feeling very hot because this is actually emitting a lot of heat. Uh, but somehow we are all still smiling. Um, anyway, so this this is the picture of a rotary kiln uh, in action. Um, so this is what you get. You get cement uh, uh, from here. And then finally, as you know, the cement is what is ultimately uh, transformed into uh, concrete. Right, so cement is just an ingredient of concrete. Okay. Um, to get a little bit more into uh, detail, uh, just what is happening inside the kiln here, essentially you start off with a calcium carbonate, which is your limestone. Then you have you know, quartz, silica, and clay materials, uh, which provide the alumina and silica, and then there's some iron. And uh, on the x-axis, you have time, which is here in minutes. And on the y-axis here, you have the proportions by weight. And on the other y-axis, you have the temperature in degrees Celsius, so you're going all the way up to 1400. And this uh, line here, which is represents basically um, uh, those temperatures. So initially you start to take off, uh, uh, you calcine your calcium carbonate. So this is where you release CO2 and nearly two thirds of the emissions associated with cement are coming from the CO2 that is released uh, right here. Right, so this is kind of the big part which, where uh, you emit a lot of CO2 and you're left over with calcium oxide, which reacts with the silica to form calcium silicates. The other part, roughly one third to uh, 35 to 40% comes from the fuels which are needed to reach these high temperatures in the kiln. So those are the parts where the CO2 emissions come from, which uh, are being the subject of research uh, uh, very much in the past uh, two decades. Then you start to form these phases in the sintering zone, uh, A-light, B-light, and the liquid phase. And finally, at the end, when you start to cool off this material, you end off with these uh, four different phases, which are essentially a mixture of calcium silicate and calcium aluminate phases. So your A-light and B-light are the calcium silicate phases, and your C3 and C4F are the aluminate phases uh, that form. And together, these four phases are what contribute our modern Portland cement. And of course, there's a few minor phases too, and we'll talk about them, but essentially these are the ones that give uh, the strength and all the amazing properties that we have in these material. Okay. So um, let's maybe uh, move on to now. So that was kind of the general introduction of you know, what has happened maybe in the, uh, in the past few centuries and, and where are we today? So I'm gonna now start talking about specifically three uh, individual stories on these three topics. So before I do that, if there are any questions, I'm going to take a pause here. So feel free to ask if you have anything uh, so far. Professor Garg, 
in your previous slide, mm -hmm. on the uh, bottom line, you've written MN. Is this minutes in the kiln? Yes, indeed, it's minutes. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right, so I uh, hear silence. I'm going to move on here, but yeah, as you have questions or things you want to talk about, feel free to put them in the chat and we can uh, we can talk more. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's talk about these three things uh, kind of, you know, uh, that I've defined here. And, you know, these are somewhat uh, become uh, buzzwords today. So we have sustainability, uh, circularity, and, and resilience. And depending on who you talk to and who you ask, uh, they could be defined slightly differently. So I thought I would give them a flavor uh, of my own uh, based on also from a construction materials perspective. And so I found these three uh, logos and I think they're pretty much going to uh, be defining uh, what we have here. So let's start off with the first one, which is uh, sustainability. And I was thinking of, uh, you know, what kind of a definition uh, to to put here for sustainability again, depending on who you ask, depending on what your source is, the definition could very much change. So I thought let's go to uh, something which is maybe uh, outside my control. So I simply asked uh, Chat GPT to give me a definition of uh, the three terms, and I told them that I'm giving a webinar to the CE alumni, and this is what it gave me. Right. So definition of sustainability here is. Uh, meeting today's needs without jeopardizing, jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet their own encompassing economic, social, and environmental uh, considerations, right? So I think the way I really see this, you know, meeting today's needs without uh, jeopardizing the ability of the future generations, right? And one of the things here, um, which has now become a major source of interest are the you know, carbon emissions. And we're gonna talk a little bit about sustainability in that uh, framework. So if you look at really, really a big perspective, let, really let's look at from a planet perspective. Uh, so this is our home, which we all share. If we put the time on the x-axis and let's just look at the past uh, few decades. And if you put the population on the y-axis, um, we are expecting really here a kind of a growing trend. Many people will say this is kind of a, you know, um, exponential trend. And this is what it, it essentially looks like. This is the data until 2012 or so. But if you really show this to somebody who works with construction materials, they will tell you this is not a exponential trend. Really, if you put a materials production on another y-axis, and if you start to plot uh, something like cement, that's when you see a truly uh, exponential growth, right? So in the really in the, in the decade from 2000 to 2010, it has really taken off. To put something in perspective, to so put uh, steel, a similar kind of uh, Increase also happened, but again, nowhere close to cement. And this is largely due to growth in uh, uh, Eastern Asia, and uh, specifically China, we saw uh, uh, this huge production. And if this is to continue, we are expecting similar surges coming from uh, India as well as uh, Africa up to 2050. So if you move this now uh, data to the side, So there's a question about the rotary cement cleans uh, insulated. I think, well, I guess the heat recovery is definitely an issue. So this really varies from plant to plant. Uh, in general, they do want to avoid the heat losses as much as possible. But yeah, there is definitely some heat loss there. If you look at the first problem here from producing this much cement, um, essentially it's one ton of cement uh, leads to about 0.8 tons of CO2 during its manufacture. So the cement industry alone contributes to about 5 to 8% of global CO2 emission. And this is massive because the, if you consider the entire aviation industry, that contributes about uh, 2%. Now, if we look at our Earth's crust here, and you know, from a construction point of view, we can only access uh, the Earth's crust. We can't really dig deeper than that because it's, it's just the mantle is more or less inaccessible as of today. So we have to really play with the elements that are present. And maybe this is a point I will try to ask the audience like a small uh, question. Um, can, you, can you tell me what is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust? If you write that in the chat, what, or what do you think is the most abundant element?
Okay, so we have some uh, suggestions in the chat. We have iron, we have silica. Uh, can you? Okay, so we have nitrogen. Any other? Uh, any other guesses? Okay. Okay. Very interesting, right? So, so let me uh, uh, say what is indeed the case. So, indeed, we have a lot of iron in our earth, but it's mostly in the core. The you know the core is molten, so all the iron is settled there. And uh, there is a lot of silica, but it's not the number one. It's actually number two. Of course, there's a lot of nitrogen uh, in the atmosphere, but not in the crust. And similarly, again, carbon. We have a lot of carbon in the living organisms, but really in the Earth's crust, not so much. So let me reveal uh, the the element here is actually oxygen, right? So oxygen pervades all the minerals and the phases that are present in the Earth's crust. And then after that, we have silicon, aluminum, iron, and so on. So, right, so everything is oxidized, essentially. Now, if you look at the composition of a typical cement, uh, you would be surprised that it's actually uh, quite different in the sense, of course, it has quite a bit of oxygen, but really it's a calcium uh, uh, rich component. And this comes to our problem number two, we have a relatively poor understanding of abundant silicate and luminosilicate, uh, such as clays in the context of replication in an cement. So we are not really using what we have in the Earth's crust, we're essentially using quite a bit of um, actually limestone to, to make the cements, which releases CO2, and that causes one of the issues that we have today. Now let's look I briefly at the numbers, and these are back of the envelope calculations. If you'd consider what 4 billion tons of cement was produced in 2019, and nearly 800 kilograms CO2 per ton is released, you have about uh, over 3 billion tons of CO2 uh, that comes out of this. And if you compare the total CO2 emissions of the European Union from all uh, sources, it's about 2.5. So that means these uh, little harmless looking bags of cement are actually causing more uh, CO2 emissions than the entire uh, continent uh, and, and the entire EU uh, union, right? So this, these these numbers are massive. And again, as I said, um, the global uh, aviation industry pales in comparison to, to cement. Cement is maybe three to four times more than that. If you look at the worldwide carbon emissions here, um, you know all that in the past few decades. Of course, this has also uh, skyrocketed. We are consistently above 35 billion tons. And if you zoom into it the past decade, you can see we have been consistent about more than 35 billion tons of CO2 is being released. And if you look, zoom in in the past uh, few years, you see there's a small dip in the year 2020. And we all know what happened in the year 2020. But I think what is really uh, interesting is that this was really just a minor dip, even though the society came to a standstill. Because many of the industrial processes, uh, such as things such as cement production and so on, actually continued. So there is a, uh, did not, there, there was not a huge dent. And then whether when you consider the actual CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, there's a lag there in affecting that, there was also not a huge difference there. So what this really means is that if you need to solve this problem, we'll have to take drastic steps uh, to curb these emissions. Um, to add to this, if you consider the latest uh, IPCC report from March, 2023, um, they suggest that if you want to limit warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, we need to have very rapid, deep, uh, and immediate uh, greenhouse gas reduction. What does that mean if you look in a graphical point of view? So if you have uh, CO2 emissions in gigatons of CO2 per year um, over the 21st century, uh, this is where we are right now in 2020, or a little bit around that, 2023. And there's different scenarios. The 1.5 degree scenario is this one, two degrees Celsius is here, and then 3.2, uh, degree Celsius here, which is basically uh, the current policies. And you can see that if we have to do 1.5 degrees Celsius, we really need to start uh, rapidly decarbonizing um, uh, these CO2 emissions, which I think is very, very uh, challenging if we have to do that. But this is the challenge that is in front of us if we consider the CO2 problem. Now, what are the solutions, right? Especially from a construction materials or a cement point of view, there are essentially three pathways that one can consider. One is you know avoid emissions, the second is reduce emissions, and the third is the capture emissions. The first one, avoid emissions, is um, I think is 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 quite challenging because that basically means that we do not produce uh, cement or any other construction material, and that means we stop building. And I think personally that is going to be very very difficult, considering that we are going to go from a population of eight billion 
to 10 billion uh, by 2050. And even the current population in many parts of the world does not have uh, sufficient access to housing. So given that uh, all the infrastructure needs and the housing needs, I don't think the, the first option um, is actually viable from a construction material point of view. Now, if you consider the second and the third, I think there are some uh, opportunities there and I'm gonna briefly talk about them. If you think about reduced emissions, we really need to consider the ingredients in concrete. And many of you know this, but just to kind of be on the same page, so we have cement, which is the most expensive as well as the most CO2 intensive uh, component. Uh, you add this to, to fine aggregates, which is sand, coarse aggregates, which is gravel, you add water and some chemical admixtures, uh, and then you finally uh, mix them together and you get concrete, which is um, the basic building material, mo the most uh, consumed material on our planet after water. And if you add reinforcement to it, it becomes you know, reinforced concrete, as you all know, which is also, again, uh, responsible for all the, the infrastructure we have today. Now, it's the cement component that is the most CO2 intensive and expensive. So typically this is replaced or can be replaced by supplementary cementation materials. And it has been done historically, primarily for the reasons of cost and also uh, improvement in performance uh, with materials such as mostly waste materials, such as silica fume, uh, slag and fly ash, which are coming from these other industries. Now, the problem uh, with some of these materials is that specifically fly ash, uh, the coal production in the US and many uh, developed parts of the world is, is really going down. It's really plummeting. In the past 10 years with the shutdown of the coal power plants, the flash production uh, is, is really, uh, has been uh, decreased and that causes a huge problem because we are typically used to replacing cement with flash. And thus there is now a new, uh, and the other SEMs such as slag, they're already uh, limited in supplies because they're limited by how much steel we're producing. And as we also move towards uh, different ways of making steel which are more sustainable, uh, this existing supplies may also uh, be in, in, in danger. So then there's a lot of interest in now using newer kind of SCMs um, to replace these. And now there's a lot of research going on calcium clays. Uh, my group has been also looking into the VR. I'm not going to talk about them a lot uh, in this uh, webinar because again, there's, there's only so many things I can talk about. But essentially, we are also then looking at industrial residues, which is essentially powdered uh, materials coming out of other industrial processes, which let's say nobody wants, we're going to landfill, can they be used to replace cement? Of course, there's they are going to have some performance issues, but if it's done in a smart way, we could reduce uh, emissions quite a bit. Um, one thing to kind of, you know, to note here that cements are actually very uh, complicated materials. You know, in this picture, it essentially looks like a uh, gray powder, but if we have to be smartly engineered it and replace it with other things, we really need to understand how it is on the micro scale. So one of the techniques that I've been uh, uh, developing here uh, as part of my research in the past few years is utilizing something known as Raman imaging uh, for identifying phases uh, in this uh, system. So essentially how it works is essentially if you, let's say, take a optical image or a picture of a, of a material here, in this case, it's a rock, you collect uh, uh, spectra from Raman's uh, from Raman spectrometer at each grid point. You develop based on this uh, essentially a set of uh, spectra, which you then split based on uh, their categories, and then you can have the spatial distribution of different phases that were present in that original uh, image. Right, so you can see here uh, essentially by doing this uh, hyperspectral imaging or mapping, we can distinguish these different phases that are present. Uh, I'm gonna sh show here an example here uh, where this has been done. And maybe I would like to ask the audience quickly if they can um, identify what I'm showing here. I'm sure many of you have uh, 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 used this material in your life, maybe many times. So question is, does anyone want to guess what I'm showing here in the bottom left? Yeah, essentially, right? This is a, uh, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a cross section of the, of the medicine, as you all mentioned, and you can see that you can see all the different components. You can see caffeine, you can see Tylenol, and you can see aspirin. So with this, you can not only see the different phases that are present, you can quantify them, but you can also see how they're spatially distributed. So if there was a quality control problem, 
And if you are somebody like me who likes to, you know, split the medicine in half and sometimes take half of it, and if all the caffeine was on one side, I would be just getting high on caffeine, right? So this is where a, a technique like this could be useful, where you can say, not only see what phase are present, but how they are spatially distributed. And the idea here is, can we do the same thing uh, for cements? So if you look at the um, ordinary Portland cement, we did this exactly the same idea. We took cast this into like a small uh, pellet on a 13 millimeter scale. We developed this composite map uh, with Raman imaging where we can detect all the phases that are present. And we compare that with the traditional technique and we, we see a very decent correlation what we are detecting. And just to help you appreciate, these are very high resolution maps. So each of this image has about a quarter million pixels, which means that we can really get high statistics in terms of counting uh, what are the phases present. And the resolution is on the order of microns. And we can make these um, different maps of the uh, phases that are present in, in cement, and which is really, uh, I think, amazing because now you can now see how the phase are distributed and you can also quantify how much of it is present in that cement. So that gray powder that I was talking about is actually a mixture of these uh, you know, nine to 10 different phases. And then you know, there's also uh, some fun things you can do here. Uh, if I was at a, let's say, cement related conference, I would ask the audience what this phase is, but I'm not gonna ask you that question. Uh, but essentially this is actually not a phase from the Raman uh, image. This is actually the picture of the night sky taken by one of my grad students uh, with his iPhone. So essentially what we're doing here is what like you can say astronomers do. We're just looking at um, uh, the bright pixels. Uh, in this case, it starts, but in our case, it's the individual phases uh, that we care about and that we count them. Uh, you can take this one step further. You can say that, you know, you can use this analysis for um, the shape analysis of the individual uh, particles. If you look at, do this in high resolution, you can, now start to get individual size and shape of these systems. So you can start to plot the particle size distributions of each individual phase in the system, and you can obtain all sorts of shape characteristics, which were previously uh, not easy to get. And this work just came out uh, a few months ago. And this again shows that advance, which uh, which was not possible. For, for a typical, you can say cement manufacturer, they're only looking at an average distribution, but here we say, you can now get 10 particle size distributions for the 10 components in a cement. Um, in terms of uh, capturing emissions, uh, one thing there has been now a lot of interest is capturing CO2 back into cement or in, back into concrete because that's the CO2 that was emitted and can be uh, uh, captured back. And now there's a lot of questions around how do you quantify that CO2? And there's because there's an accountability issue and there too we have been uh, using these advanced imaging techniques where over time, you can see how calcium carbonate is growing on the surface to, to measure how the CO2 is being captured. Similarly, you can see in, in samples where we expose the samples from, with CO2 just from one side, you can see over time how calcium carbonate is flowing because CO2 is being uh, essentially sucked in from the top. And these kind of uh, works are going to be helpful if you want to quantify or uh, do proper accounting of how much CO2 can be stored uh, within concrete. Because one of the issues again is that if you can capture CO2, you know where do you store it? Um, either you send it underground, but the other option is you can also use it in a construction material like concrete. So I'm going to start here now with the next part, which is on circularity. Uh, but I'm going to maybe take a quick pause here if anybody has any questions on the the previous section. Okay, so I'm gonna um, keep going. Um, if you think about circularity, again, uh, really depends on how we define it, but really I think the way uh, it was defined here is uh, it's an economic system that minimizes waste by prioritizing reuse, refurbishment, remanufacturing, and so on. So I was really glad you know, that the minimizing waste was kind of the part of circularity and which is exactly uh, what we are focusing on here. If you consider the waste production um, worldwide, and again, this is maybe a small quiz for the audience here. What do you think is the average waste production per person per day? And I'll give you these three options. So maybe just uh, pick one and write down in the chat.
Okay, so I see a quite a few of uh, C's and uh, B's. Nobody's going for A. Okay, so, so let me share the answer here. Um, actually, B is the average, and this is the worldwide um, average. Uh, and A and C are the min and the max. So these are the range. And actually, if you are in a developed uh, part of the world, such as uh, uh, the US here, you will be more closer to C because we produce much more waste uh, than the world average per person. You can look at this uh, statistics in the global waste problem. If you look at worldwide, if you look at million of tons per year and look at some projections up to 2050, um, we have maybe about 2000 million tons uh, right now, but we're going all the way up to 3,500. Interestingly, if you compare this to the human uh, biomass in 2021, uh, essentially, if you take the weight of every human being on this planet and you put that on a scale, uh, we'll come to that number and you can see we are producing obviously much more than what we weigh. Uh, if you do this just for North America, let's say a developed part of the world, you can see this uh, difference becomes even more exaggerated. If human mass is around here, uh, the, the waste produced is, is way, way up there. So this means that we have really a waste problem where we keep on producing, producing waste. Uh, and at some point we have to figure out, you know, what to, what to do with it. And that's an ongoing problem in places, especially where the population density is high. So you know, how do we manage the waste problem in the US? There's about uh, 300 million tons of waste that is generated. Uh, about a fraction of that, really 10% is incinerated and half of it is landfilled because we have a lot of landfill space. And uh, if we look at the waste to energy capacity um, in, um, in the US, it's really kind of you know, odd depending on you know, what state laws permitted those plants. But if you look at the waste lying in landfills, also they, this is also depending on again, how the landfill spaces were allocated. If you look at the population density of the US and on top of that, we plot all these waste to energy facilities where you essentially incinerate the waste, you will see there's some correlation between a lot of high population density areas such as the Northeast, but then there are also some areas where the WT facility just uh, exists again, just because of the local state laws. Uh, there's also cases where some states do not want their waste, so they're shipping their waste from one place to another. I heard you know, recently that uh, some of the waste from Connecticut is being trucked all the way to Ohio to be landfilled there because uh, in Connecticut, they don't have space to store their waste. Now, uh, one thing you can do with this uh, waste is this the waste to energy uh, process where you burn the waste and convert it into ash. Uh, so this is a kind of a rather complicated looking uh, diagram here, which essentially shows how you uh, your, your uh, tipping truck puts the waste in, this, in these big pits where it's burned. And then the energy produced is used to give electricity to the local community, and the leftover ash is then uh, sent to landfill. And one of my uh, postdocs here, he created these kind of funny uh, GIFs for the kind of broader audience. I'm going to quickly show you those just to get the point across. So if you consider in terms of all the, I guess, Avenger superheroes, the incineration part here uh, is this is what is exactly uh, happening here. Uh, the next part is here, if you consider the Atman, you are really shrinking down the waste. So you are really making it small. And that's the entire part of the waste energy. You, you make it much more smaller. And then you the generated heat can be then uh, converted to electricity using a steam turbine and a generator. And then finally, you have the uh, various environmental separation processes, including magnetic um, separation where you can get the metals and the ferrous uh, metals out. So here's a magneto uh, beam there. So here's a, a picture from one of the plants uh, very close to us in Indianapolis. So if this is the picture of the waste. So after burning it, again, 80 to 90% volume reduction happens and they're left over with metals and you're left over with this bottom ash and the fly ash. And these metals obviously have value because they can be sold uh, in the secondary markets, but the ashes really uh, do not uh, have much value other than that they are sent to landfill. So what we have been exploring is can we use these ashes in something useful? Um, so when we look at their composition, we find that actually these ashes uh, are actually very close to composition-wise uh, what we have in our ordinary portent cement. So the first thing we thought was, well, let's try to use them as a replacement uh, for cement. And we found them to be uh, somewhat useful in the sense they were able to give us uh, some compressive strength and we were able to define our own coefficient which can uh, predict that strength. However, the, their performance was not 
uh, very stellar again, given that given the complexity of the phases that are present, and there was not much of a reaction that would have expected in these uh, materials. Um, the other thing that we have been focusing on is figuring out what kind of phases exist in these ashes, because understanding what those phases are is very key to not only predicting their performance, but also to figure out what are the hazardous elements that are present, because there's quite a bit of toxic elements present in these ashes. So we were having issues with uh, collecting, in one of the techniques we get this basically a very broad background uh, we call fluorescence, which limits any detection. And we figured out then again, by a, by a simple process of photo bleaching, we expose the samples to laser for two minutes, we we're actually able to improve the detection of the phases quite a bit. So if we look at this further, we are able to detect some of the key phases uh, in these systems. If you take this now to several ashes where we take a set of 12 ashes where we do this consistently, we're actually able to see that if we took, take a look from the left to the right picture, we enable the detection of these phases quite well. And again, this work was also uh, uh, recently uh, published or this available. Finally, we can again do imaging in these ashes. Again, these gray uh, looking powders are actually made up of mixture of many different phases, uh, which are highly, highly complicated. So we can start to map out those individual phases at the micron scale. And this is of relevance because we can now uh, detect phases uh, containing lead and barium, which are both toxic and makes these ashes hazardous. So it's it's a lot of uh, a problem for the WT plants to landfill them. So they have to convert them to non-hazardous first before they can landfill. And, and now we're able to detect them and we're continuing our work to see if we can treat them in a way to get rid of these. Okay, all right. So that was the part on circularity, really the general message here, you know, if you're producing a lot of waste, uh, the waste to energy is one pathway to reduce that waste, but of course we'll have to deal with these ashes and figure out a way to to do something with them. Okay. Any questions on that before I start with the resilience side? Okay, right. So I guess uh, in interest of time, I'm gonna keep on moving, and maybe we can have questions at the end. So the final thing here is on the resilience part. And uh, again, the definition I got here from, you know, this was the capacity of systems to anticipate, withstand, and recover from disturbances, um, adapting to ensure continuity and safety. So I think this is, you know, I think quite, quite important. And we, we, we sometimes, um, it's not enough talked about, but if we, if we consider some of the major structural failures that have happened uh, recently. So I just, you know, pick two here. So this is, uh, as you are all well aware, the Surfside condo collapse in uh, Florida in 2021. So this is a picture of the condo before the collapse. And then here's a picture after the collapse. It was completely uh, gone uh, very quickly. And uh, nearly 98 lives were lost. And if you look at the potential cause of failure of the reinforced concrete, uh, uh, there's a uh, water penetration and the corrosion of steel uh, that has been cited. Uh, but of course, there's also a detailed investigation by NIST that is undergoing. So the exact cause of failure, or there could be multiple causes uh, that will come out. But for now, this is what we know. Uh, looking at another uh, large structure failure, uh, again, in the in the recent history is the this big uh, bridge collapse, the Morandi bridge collapse in Italy, uh, where you can see this, this section that essentially in the middle, essentially was gone. And uh, if you look at coming again from another vantage point of view with this, this entire section of the bridge, which was basically gone while the bridge was uh, being used actively uh, by the traffic. And here's another picture where you see that middle part is completely uh, missing. And here too, roughly 43 lives were lost and uh, the potential causes, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to say uh, because I think there, there's still, there's a lot of, things going on, but one of the things I read here was corrosion was had likely to play a huge role in this. So if you, if you think about, you know, the from a resilience point of view, especially for uh, reinforced concrete, you know, really it comes out to, you know, water ingress as well as, you know, corrosion. So one thing to consider is can we understand the interface between water and these construction materials and try to either prevent that water ingress um, or, or predict it better. So one thing we have been looking at is looking at the contact angle measurements for wettability assessment. And uh, essentially we define 
the content angle defines how well how much a system uh, uh, ca can be can be uh, sub uh, what is the rate of wetting on a system so if you have a poor wetting and hydrophobic system the content angle will be greater than 90 degree in a good wetting system and a hydrophilic system this will be less than 90 so we started looking at uh, starting with the metal we started looking at aluminum and we say okay can we try to make it super hydrophobic uh, especially the large scale and we figure out uh, there are pathways where you can make these um, channels uh, these micro channels which increases the the surface energy uh, uh, to to make a droplet uh, hydrophobic so you can look at this in a highly uh, scanning electron microscope image we make these tiny pillars with the laser and with this, we are able to actually have a droplet, which basically does not wet the surface. And if we look at this uh, in an actual uh, sample in action, so you have the untreated sample on the left and the treated one on the right, you can see once you treat it with this uh, coating, essentially the material becomes super hydrophobic. So the water simply does not wet the material, it jets off. And the idea would be if we can do this on a large scale, on large scale structures, we can maybe totally prevent uh, uh, the water ingress or any kind of corrosion that may happen at the surface. Uh, then naturally we start to think about, okay, can we do this also with things such as concrete? So if you look at uh, you know hydrophobic concrete or concrete where we have coatings to, to prevent that water ingress. And again, uh, in, a, in a very basic sample, if you have a treated and untreated sample, uh, you can see that uh, you can prevent this water ingress by simply having a hydrophobic coating. And by the way, I should mention that the droplet on the left basically shows an upside down view of my lab. So that white part here is the floor. And in the middle, you're seeing the lights from the camera. But what one thing is very interesting happening in this video, let's see if it plays again. If you watch very closely, you see when the droplet on the right falls down, you can actually start to see in real time how the water is going through. So we thought this is very interesting. We can actually train a computer vision algorithm on how the water is going in and try to maybe predict uh, the subtivity of the system. And that's what exactly uh, we did. We first actually developed a low cost content angle uh, goniometer in the lab. Um, essentially the goniometer we were using was a little bit expensive in the in the shared facility. So we said, okay, why don't we buy a bunch of cameras and we develop one on our own. So this was uh, essentially trained on, on thousands of images where we can measure in real time how the content angle changes. And uh, that helps us basically measure a variety of materials in, in this setup. We take this and uh, try to see if we can predict softivity uh, via the wettability. And what we do here is uh, we take the drop volume and see if it is correlated to how the water goes into uh, the cement uh, uh, substrate. So in this video, again, we take a range of samples which have different ability to take in water. And we find out as we put this droplet the change in the volume of the droplet is highly correlated to the soft DVDs. So essentially, the highly porous materials will take in water faster, they will degrade faster, they will have faster corrosion, whereas opposed to materials which are much more dense and, and less, less porous. So I feel like this, these tests are going to play, uh, can play an important role in predicting durability of these materials because that's a very challenging uh, task. So if you were to uh, summarize here, kind of looking at the outlook, from what we have uh, gone through. There's a bunch of publications that have come out of uh, our group in the past uh, three years. So whatever I talked about today, if you want to go into the details, you're welcome to take a uh, look at any of these. And if you want a copy of, uh, of any of these, you can feel free to write to me and I'll send it to you. But really, I think if you talk about the three things, you know, from a sustainability point of view, there's now a huge interest in reducing the you know carbon footprint of concrete. This has always existed in the past uh, two or three decades, but now it has really accelerated and gone through the through the roof because the end users or the customers are now also asking uh, for this, including uh, many, many tech companies. And there are opportunities for reducing uh, as well as capturing emissions, but we have to consider the short term and the long term uh, feasibility of this because uh, especially things such as carbon capture uh, and storage is going to be very expensive, whereas replacing cement with SEMs, at least in the short term, uh, is very much feasible. If you think about circularity, um, the waste problem is going to be with us as long as we're here. So we have to think about what are some effective approaches. If we consider waste incineration, I think that is potentially a, a good approach. However, we must figure out what to do with these ashes, which are potentially hazardous. And finally, uh, in terms of resilience, you know, water ingress and, and corrosion tend to be one of the major causes for degradation of reinforced concrete. So if we can figure out a way 
to either predict or pre and prevent uh, this water ingress, uh, we can make our structures much more uh, resilient. With that, I wanna uh, maybe come to uh, the end and maybe really uh, show you this initial timeline I showed you in the beginning. And uh, we talked about these different centuries, but you know we looked back, but I also wanna look a little bit forward and we often don't do that, but I think it's it's fun to do this. If we think maybe now 700 years in the future, right, for the 28th uh, century, you know, what will be our um, uh, uh, legacy, right? What will be their, uh, what will be built today that we want to see? And uh, this is something we should definitely talk about. I'm very much happy to hear if any of you have any thoughts or suggestions or, or comments. And uh, because this is something I think personally we should think about. Sometimes we are a little bit focused too much on 2030, 2050, but I, and it's, it's good to think about those things, but I think we also don't want to be short-sighted. We want to think what we are building today, uh, is it lasting for those 700 years? And what do we want to do uh, in that future? Do we want to continue build uh, cities uh, here on earth or do we want to build uh, on other uh, planets too? So there's a lot to think about, um, but that is uh, what I like to, to do when, uh, when, when thinking about the future. Okay, with that, I would like to uh, thank all my uh, team members, my students, uh, my postdocs, my undergraduates who really uh, helped me uh, do all the work that I presented here. Uh, several of them are not in this photo because they have graduated, but I really, I owe my thanks to them. I also owe a big, big thanks to all my colleagues at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. They have been instrumental in uh, mentoring me and in supporting me in this journey. And with that, I am uh, happy to take any questions. Okay, I think I see a couple of questions in the chat and I can try to answer them one by one. So one of the questions is how much carbon would be generated from burning the waste? Yeah, that's a very good question. Indeed, uh, when you are burning waste, you are uh, releasing uh, CO2 and that is definitely a, a concern. It depends on the organic uh, matter you have in a particular waste stream, but but that's definitely uh, a concern. The CO2 emissions from those WD plants. Uh, but interestingly, I think that's not right now kind of the big focus because really, from an environmental point of view, it's the ash that they generate is much more um, kind of an important matter given that it has quite a bit of um, uh, hazardous and toxic elements uh, such as lead uh, and cadmium. Uh, then there's a question about, is the treatment of the surface a mechanical or a chemical one? It's actually a combination of a mechanical and a chemical treatment. So you first do, you form these uh, tiny pillars, you make a, a rough surface, and then you add a chemical uh, treatment on top of it. In terms of side effects, I think one has to be just careful about whatever chemicals are being used. They are they are not uh, harmful in any way to the if they are added to the groundwater. And also, we have to figure out what's their durability and how long they stick on the surface. Then there's a question about why are tech companies in are particularly interested in reducing the carbon uh, footprint of concrete? Well, I would say you know most of the tech companies uh, and we work, uh, I work with uh, uh, Meta or Facebook quite a bit, but also, you know, many of these, they are very much, they have set very aggressive uh, uh, emission standards for themselves. So some of them want to go net zero by 2030, you know, which is far more aggressive than, than some of the standards the nations have set for 2050. So they want to offset those emissions uh, from the major construction projects they're doing. So they're all building uh, data centers because that's where, uh, uh, you know, all the data, uh, is being stored. So for in those in those data centers, there's quite a bit of concrete uh, that is that is used. So we worked with uh, Meta on a data center outside uh, Chicago, where again the goal was to reduce the CO2 uh, footprint. So they're really really leading the way in in kind of demanding that low CO2 concrete. Um, then there are question on. Um, any comment or experience with blending limestone into Portland? Yeah, so I mean, this is now what is the state of the industry where we have completely switched from type one to 
to a type uh, 1L cement, which contains about 5 to 15% uh, limestone. And uh, this was essentially done again from a, a sustainability point of view because you're reducing the amount of cement uh, that is present in that, uh, in that system. And uh, obviously when you make a change, given that it's a complicated mixture of many things, there are going to be changes, but on the whole, the understanding has been that the type one L cement is actually um, better in terms of its, its uh, performance because the limestone that is present, it improves, it gives additional surface area for the reaction. And this has been adopted in Canada and Europe uh, even 10, 15 years ago. So the US is actually uh, pretty late in uh, adapting that. Um, then there's a question on what is the large use of captured CO2? Yeah, I mean, that's an open question right now. You know, what do you do with all the captured CO2? Uh, obviously, one uh, solution is the geological storage, geological deep storage, where you uh, basically send it down to an underground reservoir. And obviously, there are costs associated with that because somebody will have to do that uh, from essentially an environmental point of view. And then there's also, I guess, questions about uh, leakage and stability. The other option that is now emerging from a construction materials point of view is to use that CO2 to uh, store that into concrete or uh, develop construction materials uh, with that CO2. So that way it's it's locked into a stable carbonate form and there's a little risk of uh, leaking back into the atmosphere. Okay, and let's see here. And there's a question about, uh, let me see. I think developments relating to imparting um, higher tensile uh, resistance to concrete. I mean, in general, we all know that, you know, concrete is um, performs uh, poorly when it comes to the, the tensile strength. So there has been now interesting, we have been looking at uh, this ultra high performance concrete or the UHPC, which is embedded with uh, steel fibers which as a composite can have three to four times higher strength uh, than your normal concrete. So for that concrete, your uh, tensile strength is also um, uh, improved. Okay, and then there's a question about, uh, I realize this was focused on cement. However, I've heard discussions concerning the future supplies of usable sand. Yeah, I think this is again, um, uh, I did not talk too much about it, but uh, I think this is also another issue because if, if you consider uh, sand essentially is also at least you know pure sand, which is basically quartz, is also a resource. And depending on, again, where you are, which part of the world you are in, uh, there has been um, uh, issues regarding um, scarcity of that. And, and moving forward, we will be seeing that we will become more and more of a global economy where ship, things are being shipped from one part to the other. So if, if you consider, for example, the American market right now, uh, the cement uh, that is being produced in the US is actually completely sold out. So we actually import quite a bit of cement from Turkey. So it comes all the way from Turkey uh, to uh, to the US uh, harbor and is being used here. And, and moving forward, we are gonna see this kind of, kind of a global economy because the shipping emissions associated with shipping uh, and the cost associated with it are very, very low. Uh, so, that's we will have to basically move materials around and this will become even more complicated when different countries will um, uh, impart their own co2 emissions so it could be then uh, the cement or the construction materials or let's say certain materials are produced in certain part of the world where the emissions uh, standards are not as rigorous and then they are being sold elsewhere uh, so this could be happening too Are there any more questions for uh, Professor? All right. Well, this was very enlightening. I really appreciated the topic. I've been involved with concrete for 30 years, and this was very enlightening. Um, thank you, Professor, for your time. And uh, I wish everybody a pleasant evening. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone.